Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, how are you today? I'm I well, thank you. I never, <laughs> I never get the chance to ask, but I really wanted to today. That's all. Today on the show, I am very happy to say that uh, we have a special guest. Did you know that? Yes. Yes, I Good. did. <laughs> uh, here to discuss every verse uh, is the publisher and the founder of Pardon Us Gaming. Deborah Honig Perizek. Deborah, thank you for coming on. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, yeah, I was really excited to have you on the show because when I saw what you had given us for uh, every verse, uh, it was really unlike anything I had seen before. Oh, and that always great. excites me. Yeah, the history of this game just by itself is really interesting to me. Can you tell us a little bit about how every verse came to be? My late husband uh, started gaming way back in the 1970s with, uh, you know, the little white box set of uh, D&D and uh, then played pretty much everything that came on the market uh, before, say, you know, 1995. He built groups. He taught his younger brother how to play. Uh, he got me uh, hooked on gaming. I really, 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 in the early 1980s, wanted to uh, play a Star Wars adventure right after Return of the Jedi came out. We didn't have, of course, any Star Wars games at that time. And so we used our set of rules and played a Star Wars adventure. And I was hooked. No ifs, ands, or buts. And, uh, right. <laughs> and so... Uh, uh, he kept developing and we kept play testing with our, uh, our gaming group back in Iowa. And uh, uh, we played scenarios, everything from, uh, like I said, Star Wars to Highlander, uh, anything else that came out of Den's head. Like uh, um, we had one adventure where uh, the four of us, uh, three guys and me, uh, plus Den as the game master, started off as simple spacers and ended up uh, becoming the um, guardians of good and evil in the every verse, actually. Then he passed on and uh, I uh, kept working for a long time and pulled myself together after uh, after he left this plane of existence. And uh, sure. I got laid off and suddenly realized that I needed something else to do. After a big, long uh, weekend role-playing session, kind of a role-playing reunion in Iowa in early, oh, mid, I guess it was mid-2015, I suddenly realized that I had a product. And so I've been working ever since and finding all that he left behind. And thank goodness right. I did backups before I got rid of his, his computer. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Well, backups, you never know how important they are until you actually have a project you're working on long term. Oh, I know. Yep. I, I pulled it off of CDs and, and pulled it out of old uh, Word Perfect and uh, got it into Word oh, wow. and finally, you know, uh, learned just how many different places that uh, uh, you can go and and, uh, and now get books on demand and layout help and, uh, yes. and artists and everything. It, it's yes. amazing. Yeah, and no, we couldn't do that many resources. years ago. Yeah, the amount of online resources, especially that are out there for all sorts of things in in game creation, is fantastic. I've had it's some great. really good luck finding some great artists and uh, some help from publishers. Uh, I'm also finding that the International Game Designers Network has been a very great resource. I I was vo voted in as a full time member uh, late last year, so I, wonderful. I'm really excited about that. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. We end up spending quite a bit of time on social media, you know, talking to people and there are tons of great artists on there and lots of great writers that uh, like to show off their work. So that, yeah, it's really easy to like shop around for, for art and proofreaders now. I know that uh, Dennis and our friend Jim, who I mentioned earlier, I uh, used to talk about trying to get things published, but, uh, you know, neither of us had the resources to put forward where you'd have to, you know, buy the books and hold the inventory and hope you sold them and, and so right. on. So now that the uh, producing on demand is just so much better. So yeah. Much better. Yeah. No, print on demand is a terrific resource. Uh, so many people are using that. When did Dennis actually start working on uh, every verse? I would say probably uh, mid to uh, 
late eighties. And okay. so, yeah, we developed it. Uh, well, he developed it. We played it in the nineties and up to the early two thousands. So you got to be one of like the early play testers as well. Yes. And uh, it was uh, myself and our friend Jim Poland, uh, Rich Seiler, and Dwayne Hartsey were the main uh, play testers. And Den was our game master. Beautiful. Uh, now, you did say that you had played a Star Wars sort of uh, RPG. A- am I going to assume that you played a Jedi? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you could say I did. But we started the adventure where I was one of the guards in the red. Uh, for the emperor. Oh, and, okay. And I don't remember all of what happened, but I ended up um, helping Luke out uh, somewhere along the line, helping him because we didn't, unlike the movies now, which I'm not a huge fan of the, the last two or three movies, mm-hmm. uh, we uh, they managed to hold the universe or the, the Republic after they won it. And then Luke and I went on some adventures to find the source of the force, which uh, uh, there was something that was starting to, to feel wrong or, or or go wrong in the force. And we actually ended up finding some kind of a, I think it was a planet with uh, some uh, type of a machine on it or something, maybe it was something organic. It's been like since the early 80s, so I don't remember exactly what happened. Uh, yeah, We uh, found the source of the force. And what was wrong is there was actually something like a cockroach in it. So there was literally a bug in the force. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That if, if episode nine ends with a cockroach in the middle of the forest, I'd actually be fine. <laughs> I'd be I, like, hey. <laughs> that would be kind of interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Like, we predicted this. <laughs> <laughs> we oh, knew it was coming. <laughs> we knew it. Yeah, so this has been a, a long time in the works, uh, if, if we're talking about like the 80s to today. You're talking about a very long development cycle, uh, yeah, which, yeah, isn't, which isn't bad necessarily. Yeah, uh, well, Dennis has been gone for a while. And so uh, okay. it took me a number of years to pull myself together. And then uh, I was still working my job as an IT professional. And a little too stressed sometimes to really put it together. Yeah. Uh, and then my late husband sent me a little dog that has helped me along the way. That's uh, how uh, I actually how I got into this because my dog because of my dog I was out walking uh, and met a neighbor because of her dogs and then she helped me get into uh, I don't really like to admit but I spent some time at MLM and uh, I did learn a few things though and that's how they were always saying you ought to have your own product too. I realized we had that after we had that gaming reunion that I had my product. So the last uh, few years since he died, there hasn't really been anything going on. But yes, still, uh, indeed, we have had a long development cycle. Was there any point where you were kind of looking at what Dennis had built and was trying to figure out what he was thinking with those mechanics or how they worked? And some of the things that I really uh, didn't get as well as I, I got now, I think it was before I had I was on the first podcast, I really uh, dove in and uh, really tried to get into what he was thinking. And so I, mm. I do have a better idea of, of things. Uh, the only thing that still kind of gets me every once in a while is, is figuring out the age pool. Um, most of the oh, rest okay. of it I can talk about in, in pretty good terms, I'd say. Uh, the main thing that uh, I'm finding is that uh, on the, the fourth book, which we're working on now, we have to edit it because so much it has happened technologically in the last few years. Is it more the actual mechanics that were, were in it that you have to start looking at, or it's the technology that you use to implement it? Uh, this is actually uh, the technology that he was suggesting for play. We're redefining cars now, uh, our vehicles uh, oh. now, because, you know, we all have our, our music uh, in the cars and we, you know, the cars are self-driving now. We're updating that. And then I think that there are a couple of other sections that uh, we're going to need to fill out a little bit just based on some current tech. Right. OK, so there's some like terminology and such. Yes. So what I'm kind of uh, getting is uh, Eververse is sort of born out of a love for role-playing games that that you and Dennis had uh, way back the long, long ago. Yeah, it was born because Den and the rest of the group, um, I'm I'm kind of a latecomer to the group. They wanted to play other scenarios, like they wanted to take uh, the movie uh, Highlander. And yeah. and play that, but uh, there wasn't a a gaming system that would allow that kind of flexibility, and uh, or m- maybe they wanted to uh, play something in in a book 
And so there just wasn't anything that they felt they could mold. And so Dan said, right. you know, hey, I can do these, you know, I can make some more uh, flexible rules. Right. Yes. Yeah. So this is sort of like the original setting nonspecific system where there there is yes. not really a setting attached. So that's really interesting. I, I like the idea because like nowadays we are familiar with a few systems where you can kind of do anything. But this was this was like before any of that was around. Um, I, I guess so. Yes, I'm pretty sure. And again, Alex will tell you I'm not an expert at this. Nathan is of- definitely not an expert. On these I'm not an expert at pretty much anything <laughs> except Pokemon. I know for when I was younger, Nathan, a lot of things we did instead of like playing D and D by the book, for instance, was we would just not use a book and it would just kind of be off the cuff role play. Okay, um, but that's that's still a little different. So I you were kind of trying to use the system, uh, but in a not the setting kind of scenario. Didn't even use the system. Didn't have dice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. yeah. Wow. Okay. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh boy. The wow. A diceless way of doing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, That's a... from what what I've heard from our friend Jim. Um, he and Den used to do that. Uh, it, way back in the in the early days of this development, they they were they didn't use dice, and uh, they I think they even used to play in our our uh, um, college planetarium. That sounds like a really fun place to play a game, honestly. I think that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't I wish... involved at, at that time, but uh, I need to, it, it uh, sounds like it'd be cool. I need to find a planetarium and a gaming group that can abuse this planetarium. <laughs> <laughs> Star War- Play Star Wars or Warhammer in a planetarium and you'll be good. That's, oh, wow. Oh, that'd be great. I like that. Oh, That's great. Yeah. And you know what you can do is if you can uh, if you can link it up to your roll twenty map, you can put the roll twenty map on the on the planetarium. Oh, Great, yeah. no. <laughs> put your characters on. <laughs> no, <laughs> there you go. That would be fun. Way to, way to ruin an atmosphere, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> you just want the stars. Yep. You just want the well. That's fine too. That works. <laughs> um, the thing I know is going to interest uh, Alex, and uh, I thought it was very interesting, but he'll probably understand it better is uh, the actual mechanics of every verse. So can you tell me a little bit about the branching uh, skill tree? You start off um, in, when you're rolling your character or you're generating your character, uh, you determine how many terms you want to, to serve in a profession. And, and uh, we, in the book, we give examples of professions, but you could really be, uh, you know, that unicorn detective if you want. Perfect. As long as your game master says, hey, that's groovy, then, then okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, you determine how many terms you've served. And from there, you get your skill points. And it's uh, three uh, skill points per year or 12 for a four-year term. Uh, every term is four years. And then uh, if uh, you look at the character sheets that we have, uh, I think I spent on these, since these are, this is a character sheet that I gave you for a, a one shot, a demo one shot. Uh, we really used only uh, 12 points out of the, out of the possible 24 for the okay. two year term. We start with the most general level, uh, say for example, the vehicle and uh, right. what it is, uh, what's its primary attribute, which is the motion skill. And then that gives you your base score of mm-hmm. uh, 110. And uh, you can find that at the top of the character sheet, of course. And then okay. how many skill points that you put in. Each level has to have three points in it to get to go to the next more specific level. Uh, you can see that the vehicle has three in it. And then um, they could go to the air since they wanted to specialize in things that fly. That one has uh, skill points of three in it. And uh, then they could go on to the more specific helicopter. And since that has only one skill point in it, now they were just uh, getting started. So then the add column that we have is how many skill points you get to add to the base to find the skill score that you will be rolling against when you make any attempts. And so in the first level, you get to add three. So that uh, becomes a 113 since your motion skill is 110. In the air, uh, when you get to the next uh, more specific, the air category, you get to add six because you have what you learned as, you know, in general vehicle skills. And then what you've learned now 
in air. And so you get to add six to the motion for uh, a skill score there of 116. Mm -hmm. And then roughly the same thing for the uh, helicopter where you get to add one, you get to add uh, all of the previous skill points plus that one for the 117. Okay. I see what, I see what Nathan means by branching now. So it, it's kind of like umbrellas where you go from general skills to very specific skills. Yeah, we call it a tree. Yeah, yeah. that that makes sense. It's got branches. <laughs> yeah, and so then when you uh, you would roll, uh, you make your attempt and um, say you're going to, you know, just try to start a vehicle. Um, and so then uh, we would put any modifier, say my attempt is I'm going to try to start this helicopter or what. Uh, actually, I guess uh, um, then we would, if we were going to do the helicopter, you'd mo- know um, in specific what you're supposed to do. So Mm -hmm. then you'd have any uh, modifiers against that. Uh, Say like, you know, you're trying to do it in a hurry and, and, uh, you know, somebody's shooting at you. So that's a, a, you know, like a minus 10. So then say you you roll your 4D10 and uh, um, all you have to do is roll them like one at a time or get them in some kind of a row. And then if you look up that uh, score in the SD table and if your score is equal to or less than the uh, skill score minus modifiers, then you succeed it. If it's greater than, you fail. That makes sense to me probably more than it does to Nathan. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I was like, ooh, D10s. I like D10s. It's, it's, um, I know you have never played the Warhammer uh, games for no. role-playing, Nathan. No. Um, but it's, it's really similar to that where you're, you roll under your score to succeed. Oh, okay. Well, that does make sense, though. I do understand uh, why you'd want to do that. I was just uh, really interested in the fact that it was it was a D10 based system. Yeah, because I don't see so, any. So, of those. I I believe, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the fact is the higher your, higher your score is, the better your odds of success are. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so right. so you can still fail, Nathan. But you, you roll your dice and you want to get under your score that you're rolling for, and the modifiers right. make it harder to do that by subtracting mm-hmm. from the total. Right, 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 right. I get that, yeah. Because uh, if my score is higher, it is harder for me to fail if I'm trying to roll underneath it. It's easier for you to roll underneath it. Yeah. Right, because right. You're gonna your score minus the modifiers is still a higher score. And, uh, right. Got it. You sure you got this, Nathan? I I I, I got it. <laughs> if I'm rolling numbers, it's it's easier to roll underneath a 117 than if it's like a, a six, which is probably what I'd get most of the time. <laughs> yes, probably, Nathan. All my skills are a six. <laughs> you need to roll under six on 4D10. Go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Come with, on, that ones. <laughs> <laughs> with our SD table, it goes from uh, 60 to uh, 139. And so uh, the standard distribution table gives you the uh, numbers in, in general of what you can roll with the 4D10. And so you roll them out, put them in a nice row or roll them one at a time and then look that number up in there. And then the uh, row and the uh, um, the column and then the row gives you the actual score. In the branching skill tree system, you have uh, like four different layers? Not necessarily four. Um, the one in the, the character sheet has three uh, for the vehicle, and then the, the psionic has just two. But you can okay. uh, be uh, much more specific if you want to. Oh, and okay. That's the flexibility of it. Uh, uh, you cool. and the game master can kind of come up with some skills and then branch it down into some specifics. Uh, uh, let me see if I can find a, a, a good example here. See, there's a four one here with a, a vehicle, and it's on page 20 of my uh, book. It's vehicle, okay. internal combustion, aircraft, fixed wing. Uh, let's okay. see. I'm trying to find a – I thought there was a good combat one. Ah, here's a combat one that's just uh, – uh, uh, let's see. Uh, this is a three where we'd have a combat score, and then um, you studied non-recoil weapons, and then your, your specialization is laser. And uh, you studied combat and unarmed, and your specialization is karate. 
I, I like the non-recoil weapon because that applies to rocket launchers too. <laughs> you can never have too many rocket launchers. Never, not once. <laughs> Recoilless <laughs> rifles are what we call them. <laughs> Recoilless explodey rifles. Yes. <laughs> So good. I was a huge uh, Stargate SG-1 fan. Or there's a scene where Teal has like one of the of the uh, lasers from a, one of the what do they call them? The, like the X302s or whatever, and he's using that for a sidearm <laughs> or a rifle. <laughs> yeah, you can never have too many of them. Um, <laughs> that's good. So the thing I'm kind of getting from it, you know, I can kind of modify what my skills are depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. I guess uh, the way we, we put it is that um, you can use the skills at different levels. Like if you're going to use okay. general knowledge, like general vehicle knowledge, you would use that score. If you're going to use um, air, like you wanted to, to fly a plane maybe, rather than a helicopter, you could use that level of score. But then you'd have uh, some serious modifiers on that, like, you know, a plane doesn't work the same way. <laughs> right, right. So, right. So, so Nathan, it's coming across more like it's specializations instead of general. So where okay. it's the the internal combustion engine for vehicle. You could also have non-internal combustion engines. Uh, mm. So they're they're a different skill set, but they're similar to mm -hmm. other skill sets you would have. So where this one is vehicles and internal combustion, and then like aircraft, and then fixed wing. I mean, that's a very specific type of aircraft, mm -hmm. as opposed to a non-fixed wing aircraft. What I can't I can't think of one right now. Actually, a non-fixed wing <laughs> aircraft. An like Osprey. A yeah, isn't an Osprey like a VTOL vertical takeoff? Yeah, an mm -hmm. Osprey would. Yeah, is, that sounds good. Yeah, that would that's that would be that. a non-fixed wing, and flying that is completely different than flying an airplane, because it takes off like a helicopter, but it flies like a plane. So you'd right. have to. So it's like with your general skill, you could kind of maybe figure it out, but with your specific skill in it, it'd be like, yeah, you you know what you're doing, kind of deal. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's like, and Nathan, you know how to drive, but you probably don't know how to drive a semi. You don't know my life. No, I don't know how to drive a <laughs> semi. <laughs> like, you could probably get in one and figure it out. Right. But it wouldn't be as effective as someone who's been driving trucks for 10 years. Yeah, you'd have to put some serious modifiers on that. Like, you don't you don't know how to drive a stick or, you know, whatever it is. So that'd be a That's minus right. 20 or something. Um, if, oh, you're, if you're trying to use the knowledge in general, that was where the modifiers come in. Yeah, I'm. I'm not going to be very useful in a in in a robbery. Just trying to do <laughs> trying to do a heist. Oh no, I don't know what to do. Um, I can't. I can't drive a stick shift. I'm so screwed. Nathan's a safe cracker. What's his skill? He knows what safes are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, 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 what's my skill? Yeah, I've heard of a safe. I I hear that they're really nice this time of year. Uh, so, I recognize one. <laughs> I recognize one. I know that that's called a tumbler. So there's terminology. I got that going. I would probably get the negatives for like anxiety. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. there's just a lot of pressure. Yeah, um, that's where we have the equalizers. Uh, on the character okay. sheet, you'll see the anxiety is uh, minus five. And that's mm -hmm. kind of like the currency to buy the talent of plus five in this particular okay. case. And so okay. um, with the equalizers, you can take anything you want. You want to have some kind of personality quirk, like you have to wear a hat or you're, you know, you're crazy or something like that. Mm. And so in this particular case, uh, the, the uh, player has to play like they have some anxiety. And in the right. one shot, uh, these uh, um, kids are recruited, quote unquote, to uh, uh, by a, a mysterious man for his nefarious organization. And uh, so they kind of uh, suddenly find themselves in this bad situation. So anytime they have to make a role, like they want to try to uh, accept the fact that they're prisoners, uh, they have to roll with that anxiety as a minus five modifier. On the other hand, um, when they get down to uh, being able to use their psionics, uh, they have that extra five talent that mm -hmm. is added on to the mind score for the, the psionics, which is what gives the, the uh, 120 in the psionics score on the, on the character sheet. Oh, all right. How low have these scores gone? Because I can tell you that 
I would end up being the bottom of whatever that score was. So how low have you seen the scoring end up going? Oh, gosh, I can't really say for sure how low I've seen it go. In the rule book, it says if uh, your character has taken damage in the course of play or whatever, and uh, the body score or the mind score uh, get down to 60, you, you're, you know, you're unable to move or you're unconscious. You know, if, if the quality drops below that, then, you know, you're pretty much a, a goner. Right. <laughs> we uh, use the same scale as uh, the IQ score. And um, 100 is uh, the average for a population. And so uh, that's what these scores reflect. You know, if you're you have a quality of 110, then, you know, you're above average. And so um, uh, we thought that was uh, a more meaningful stat. So uh, with 60, you're pretty much. Uh, you're not there anymore, pretty much. Yeah. I'm just looking at flowers, and they look <laughs> lovely. They're <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> and I don't yeah, care about anything. Pretty great. Yeah, I can't. don't care. Yep. Now, something that I really liked in the branching system was the idea that, like, as I go down the line, I can kind of modify a little bit up and down for uh, other branches underneath. So, like, if if we're looking at the sheet that you had given me, like, the, the quality is 110. But then we've modified that a little bit for body and mind, which is right underneath it. So it goes to 105 and 115. Is five points pretty much the most that I can, like, adjust from one category to the next? Yeah, we say 10 is the most. And okay. so if you want to focus on on either body or mind and the associated skills after that, then you can shift points up to 10. But they have to average the ancestors. Okay. So uh, so if I want to try and do that, if, if I say I really want to be super good at helicoptering, for instance, would I just try to, and like move as many points as I could, like the 10 points as I go you down the skill list? Or hover over people constantly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I gain skills. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, that's, now, yeah that's, that's the definition of a helicopter parent. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan's just going to helicopter over the party. Oh, okay. So he's the helicopter <laughs> unicorn. Player. Yeah, the helicopter player. There you go. Uh, yeah, so if uh, uh, you're given a quality of, of 110 and you wanted to be a really super duper pilot, then uh, you'd probably shift your mind score down um, to, uh, let's see, it'd be uh, 100, 100 and get the body score up to uh, 120. And then you, your motion skill, you could just uh, let that 120 flow down into the motion. And so then right. that would change all these vehicle scores up by. Roughly 10. I see how that works. So now, how would my character progress? Like, how, how would I get better at things? Yeah, um, there's some uh, rules for doing some training and such in, in, in here. Uh, I have to admit, I'm a little uh, soft on those. You could say, you know, you could uh, make an at the very least make an agreement with the the, da the game master that you you want to do some more training and try to take another term in something that could give you more helicopter skills. Okay, okay. What is there any way that like my my quality score could increase over time? That I think is is a uh, um, usually a baseline where where you right. start off. Um, no, I, I don't think I've ever played it with the that uh, happening. Okay, so like the the basic kind of skill line that's that's pretty well set. It's when I get more specific skills, I might be able to make those better. You could uh, put more skill points in. Yes. Like, how do I accrue skill points? Is is there like an experience system or uh, something as I, as I go through the game? I would say it's more of a of a of a term. We've been, you know, like spacers and such like that, and so it's been uh, learn as you go, <laughs> yeah, and then pick up, you can pick up some skill scores that way. Um, the the game master could probably do some ruling on that. Do I have to worry about uh, like equipment or anything like that? If it, it feels like this is mostly uh, every verse is is more about the actual individual rather than like what they what they have on them. Yeah. yeah, we do have some equipment lists uh, with uh, some rules to uh, um, how you can get some some money uh, with okay. uh, uh, using the exponential uh, dice rolls and such like that. But uh, they're a little okay. more complicated than I have, have gone through right. um, I, on a podcast. 
Sure, sure. I I just kind of imagined that a lot of that equipment uh, equates to like equalizers. You know, they give me pluses or minuses depending on what I'm using. Uh, there are some rules in there about that. Yes. Okay. Terrific. Yeah, I was was really interested in this system just because I I really have never seen like from the second that you actually look at one of the sheets, I it is very different than anything that I've seen before because you are able to kind of like uh go down the line and really tweak your character. When did like that branching system really take form in the way I'm looking at it right now? Oh, I really couldn't say for sure. It's probably been a while, probably since we were playing in the 90s. So this was this was a really early development. I, I believe so. I, I found some old character sheets. Like I said, we had a, a gaming reunion of, uh, about three years ago. And so I went through and was looking for one character in, spe- in particular and found her. And so, yeah, this was one I hadn't played in yeah, probably since the 90s sometime, late 90s. What is your uh, favorite character to play, your favorite type of character to play? My favorite character, her name was Jim. And yes, she was a rock star uh, with, <laughs> with, uh, with, with pink hair and, and a really questionable taste in wardrobe. And uh, she was a psychic with aura powers. She had a really cool uh, spaceship that looked like it was on fire because my favorite song at, around that time was Serpentine Fire by Earth, Wind and Fire. Mm-hmm. And she usually, you know, she'd go on tour and, and end up getting involved in something <laughs> other than just making music. <laughs> Sounds about Did she right. like holograms? I have to know. Oh, probably. <laughs> probably. There. That's how the ship looked like it was on fire, Nathan. Oh, see, it all comes full circle. There Very you good. Go. <laughs> Perfect. If I were looking at like vehicles and I could I could do vehicles, but then I could kind of do air and then I could kind of do helicopter. If I'm better at doing helicopter than my normal air ability is, does that mean that something else I might not be as good at? Like maybe a plane I'd be, you know, hindered because I I'm better at helicoptering. I would say that, yeah, you pro- uh, probably want to play it that way, that uh, if you uh, were going to try to escape from a situation and you had an airplane but not and not a helicopter, then yeah. you would endeavor to get in there and, and uh, the game master would have to put on some, uh, some modifiers like, oh, my God, they're chasing you, and uh, mm-hmm. you have to try to figure out how to start the thing and, and run the controls, and you don't have any time to look at it, and you don't have any time for a pre-flight. Uh, have to give you at least a minus uh, 20 or so on your skills. So you'd end up uh, rolling against, uh, uh, you know, like a 96 rather than your, your 116. Yeah. There'd be some, some probably heavy modifiers in there. When you were saying like your quality getting down to a certain point, like when you get down to 60 and you're starting to just get into, I want to just smell the pretty flowers territory. How does my quality score decrease? Is that when I'm just not succeeding at certain things? Uh, no, it, it's more if you take damage, like some kind of a, of a psychic uh, thing, a ritual, something like that. Um, and oh, that's okay. more into, into the paranormality book, that, which is the uh, uh, first of the supplements that goes with the basic rules here. Then uh, the second supplement is uh, called Every Verse RPG Future History where we uh, go into the possible 10,000 years into the future of where uh, mankind could be. So those are the kind of things that where you take damage. Um, you know, sometimes uh, um, I think there's a good example in the paranormality about uh, somebody um, is trying to do drugs. Um, I also, mm. also, actually, I think that might be in the uh, non-combat damage where you might get poisoned or you might have an illness. You might go into... Uh, go mm. insane for some reason and uh, some medication where your your quality can go down in um, both the, the basic rules and in uh, paranormality. It sounds something I'm familiar with and it does sound like something that can be really fun and you can make your characters very specific to a skill set, which is always, always interesting. You have a lot of ability to to modify your character and tweak it right down to to some uh, pretty small levels if you if you want. I, I if suppose want. if it's mm-hmm. yeah, if you want, if, if and if the game master will allow you, and you <laughs> so, have enough skill points, and you have, and have enough skill points. points. Yep, that too, that too. Uh, all important factors, folks. <laughs> Make sure you have <laughs> those things. 
when you had mentioned a few of the one shots that you had, I was like, well, these are really different. Are there specific kinds of scenarios or uh, example scenarios that you give in the book for people to kind of like work with for the system? Uh, that is in the Future History Supplement, and uh, Dennis left 19 seed ideas for uh, possible wow. uh, scenarios, and I'm hoping that as we go along and uh, try to grow this uh, company, that we can put out those canned modules. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he's got uh, one for the middle and one for the end, uh, like the transition point between eras. And so um, some of the eras are, uh, you know, of course, the cyberpunk. And then there's one, uh, um, uh, the colonial and expansion and uh, uh, so oh, okay. on through like a res uh, renaissance. So a little bit kind of like um, an alternate kind of history settings mm -hmm. sort of that. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. And there were 19 of those. Yes. And then um, a gentleman who uh, named Jer uh, Jeremy in uh, uh, Hawaii has uh, really taken a liking to the system and uh, did uh, some scenarios as well. And so we may incorporate those someday. And that would be like, you know, 20 possible uh, canned modules that we could come up with. Yeah. Nice, nice, even 20. That's always yeah, good. Yeah, let's shoot for 20. That works for me. It's a nice round number. It's easily divisible. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I like those. Um, yeah, now yeah. I just need, a, I need uh, more time to do it. Uh, right now, all of us right. are working other professional jobs. And uh, so mm -hmm. my friend Jim and his son Josh are helping me the most now uh, with a little bit of other uh, input from uh, Jim's other son, Jared. And so uh, yeah. I was like, okay, come on, we need to we need to build this company so everybody can just come and work for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need to get it so that everyone can just work here. I like to I like the idea too that you have like another generation now that's now working on the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, yeah. when we had that game, we had uh, a, quite a mix. We had uh, four of us original players. Jim was the, the game master as uh, like the next oldest, as it were. And uh, um, then his three sons played and uh, um, Rich and his two sons played. And we also had another uh, new guy, uh, a friend of Rich's named Carrie and me. And so it was nine guys and me. <laughs> but you can just claim experience. I'm the only geek wife. <laughs> So the, the people that are working on it now, basically like your original group and also like the kids. Yes. It, is it available to, to the public? Is it out there? Yes, it's out on drivethroughrpg.com. Um, We're also on Amazon. Dennis has an author page. Also on lulu.com as an ebook, and oh, as well as, of course, on Amazon. And uh, so three of the four books now are published. I am uh, out with the help of, of Jim and his son, Josh, uh, we're working on the fourth book. And uh, then we have uh, to finish that and at least one module to uh, finish off our Kickstarter, which uh, funded, uh, well, it's about two years ago now. We're going to finish that off and then hopefully moved on to the canned modules. And we cool. also have a, a website, which is uh, www.pardonusgaming.com. Yeah, I uh, I really like what you've done here. I'm really just interested in the idea that that it's almost like one of the oldest game systems that I've really gotten a chance to talk about on the show that I just didn't even know about. And we finally get to see it. I think that that's pretty great. I'm so, yeah, I'm so glad that I'm finally able to focus the time on it. I wanted to do it for even after he passed. And uh, then I got laid off from I IT back at late 2014 and uh, then after like six months of trying to figure out what I could do I was like oh my god I can do this <laughs> and uh, so here we go it's been out uh, like since uh, late 2015 and uh, so I'm really working hard on on promotion getting the word out there now sure. as yes, well as as well it. as finishing off the, the books uh, something I like to ask people when they come on to talk about a, a specific game is if there's any advice for people who are going to be new to this, uh, for players, for GMs, if they pick up every verse, for instance, what kind of advice would you give to them starting out? Oh, wow. Gosh, that's a good one. I have no idea. If you have <laughs> questions, go <laughs> um, 
if you have any questions, I guess the best place to go is um, uh, the Pardon Us Gaming website and send us an email. Uh, we'll be uh, more than happy to uh, try to help you out. Or go on uh, um, Facebook. We, we have a page on Facebook. And uh, and so, yeah, try to send us, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'd be more than happy to help. Yep, that's that's probably the best uh, that I can I can do uh, in general. And sure. so if there's anything in it, specifically, I've had somebody ask me, um, you know, how would I, I define a superhero character? Well, mm -hmm. uh, I would start by giving them an extremely high quality. Right. Based on their, uh, uh, you know, if they're an X-Men, maybe you want to focus on mind rather than body. You know, if, if it's uh, Captain America you want to play, then, you know, he has an extremely high quality and uh, uh, probably more of a of a higher body skill. But no, sure. no slouch in the mind department. You know, right. uh, if you want to play Tony Stark, again, a, a, a high quality, uh, but focus on the mind. Uh, that's what we've done all these years. Yeah, that's pretty good advice anyway. I think it, I think that's I good advice uh, for for people is, you know, just to think about, you know, your what what your quality score is going to be and that, you know, you have to kind of think about what your character is to figure out what the stats for that character are. Right. But, but if you have a more specific question, be resources available for you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone out there? If I don't know the answer, I'll figure it out. Or I'll get Jim to help me figure it out. We'll get the team on it. The we'll team get the is team on, on it. it. That's right. right. We're going to make this happen. Well, actually, it sounds like a really interesting system that you've taken the ideas for and the work for and just improved upon it and brought it to fruition. And that's really awesome. And it sounds overall like a really interesting and fun game that I hope people get to enjoy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's actually just really inspiring. Uh, that, you know, uh, the the work that, you know, Dennis had put in over all of the years, uh, you know, you were saying how he was really hoping one day he might be able to see it published. And now here you are. It's, it's out there for all of us to enjoy as well. So uh, a big thank you to Dennis and a big thank you to you, Deborah, uh, for coming thank on the show. You. Uh, and as you said, uh, pardon us gaming, you can go over to the website. We'll make sure to give a link in the description. Does the company have any uh, social media presence or anything else if people want to get a hold of you? Uh, let's see. I'm on uh, uh, Twitter as uh, uh, Deborah Honig Parizic and uh, on Instagram as everyverse.rpg. And we're going to be at Gen Con this year. So come and see Ooh, us if you're there. We'll be excellent. in the. Uh, yeah, we'll be there with the International Game Designers Network in uh, most likely in uh, their uh, game area and not on the exhibition floor. But uh, I think, as I understand it, they get a, a room for all the demo games. So, uh, yeah, please come and see us. Yes, uh, Alex and I would uh, love to be there at some point, but we have yet to get out to Gen Con. Why, why Alex? Um. <laughs> financial <laughs> reasons time, Nathan time and, time and money <laughs> yeah I understand uh, that, that I whole understand. Patreon thing Nathan needs to take <laughs> off before we yeah, go to Gen Con it's a work in progress <laughs> that being said though thank you to our patrons uh, that, that do that do help us out and keep the digital lights on especially to our shiny level patrons Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry anyway um, <laughs> so um, Alex, if, if folks out there wanted to find the character sheets for the Delve crew, where could they go? Uh, you can find our character sheets, as it were, I guess, over at DelveCast.com. Yeah, everything that we do is over there. Uh, and also make sure to follow us on Twitter. I'm at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And you can find the podcast on all sorts of podcast apps like iTunes and Google Play and Spotify. Yes, even Spotify. Ha ha. We did it. We made it to the mountaintop. <laughs> so there. <laughs> uh, and uh, again, I want to thank uh, Deborah Honig Parizic uh, for being on the show and telling us all about every verse. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I had a great time. Yes, thank you. And thank you all for listening. And uh, until next time, uh, we will see you in the every verse. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>